You may please be seated. It's such a joy for us to be together this morning as we begin this Wednesday, the 7th of October. We appreciate each of you who tune in regularly and who have been journeying with us. We thank God so much that now in this season, we are able to gather as fellowships, we are able to gather as churches and celebrate God's goodness, but also share in fellowship, physical fellowship with one another. May God continue to protect us as a nation, protect us as churches. May God continue to lead our church leaders and ministers as we observe the soaps for the well-being of the people and to the glory of God. Our theme this morning is a call to unifying leadership. A call to unifying leadership. And we are picking on the first two verses of our reading. That is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 2. It says, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Our theme is on leadership and its own unity. And I invite you this morning to reflect with me deeply on the idea of uniting leadership or unifying leadership. Friends, there are so many forces that come up against us as a people, that come up against us as a church, as a ministry, or as a community, and these forces are bound to divide us. This season, for us as a country, is a season to prepare for leadership, to prepare for the next leadership. I pray that God will speak to every leader and potential leader to purpose to be a unifying leader. Leadership is a call of God to influence God's people towards God's purposes and his will for his people. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, which I referenced uh, just uh, uh, a while back, we are called to pray and the end is not in prayer. The end is not in supplication. The end is not in intercession. But the end of the reason we pray is that we may experience peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. This must be a collective experience as a nation, a collective experience as a church, peaceful and dignified lives, in the city, in the slums, in the urban, in the rural, in party primaries, in every home, wherever Ugandans are, that we may experience peaceful, quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. And so as we think about leadership and upcoming leadership, we note that self-serving leadership in any sector is a disgrace and a contradiction because God is concerned about the well-being of his people. God does not bless self-serving leadership. A leader must therefore speak the language of us and not I. The language of us together and not I as an individual. In the age of partisan politics, the leader has the tall order to embrace and serve all people regardless of their political affiliation. Once God calls you as a leader, you are invited and called upon to serve all of God's people. Therefore, the principle of divide and rule in leadership is of the devil and not of God. God. As we reflect on unifying leadership, there are three critical issues I want to highlight for every leader and for every potential leader, and they are the following. Number one, 
is the call to uphold human dignity. The call to uphold human dignity. We talked about dignified lives in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. There's this call to uphold human dignity. A leader must be exemplary in recognizing that we are all equal because we are all made in the image of God. There are no second class or third class citizens in any nation. The dignity of everybody must be upheld. This goes against the practice of brutality. Godly leadership avoids all forms of brutality. Anything that dehumanizes the other must be condemned when we talk about unifying leadership. If you do not like it being done to any members of your family, then it should never be done to anyone else. For you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's why it was very sad and terrible in the earlier weeks of the corona pandemic lockdown. When we saw LDUs beating those women, selling bananas and other kinds of fruits, it was so dehumanizing. We thank God for the wisdom given to our leaders when the president called off the LDUs off the streets because anything that cheapens human life is not to be upheld in any society. So the first call, the first issue to note is that of upholding human dignity. The second issue is for every leader to remember that together we have a shared heritage. Together we have a shared heritage as citizens. That this country belongs to all of us collectively. God put us here by divine act. Today we talk about the act of parliament. Today I'm saying from the scriptures, from the authority of the Holy Bible, God put us all here together uh, and gave us this heritage collectively. That's why we must maintain this unity. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 27. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 27. The Bible says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life, and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. There it is in the scriptures that God determined that Paul Waswa would be born in Uganda in this generation, not earlier, not later, not any other country, but right here, according to this text, we have reference in Acts 17, 24 to 27, which means that we collectively have this nation, this country, this geographical jurisdiction as our inheritance. None of us became a citizen by making an excellent choice. God chose to make us Ugandans. No one therefore has a right to chase anyone away or to make anyone feel uncomfortable. Together, we must make our country work. That's why we must be careful with wetlands. That's why we must be careful with forests. That's why we must avoid pollution and protect our lakes and rivers. We must make this our shared inheritance work. Leadership must ensure that everybody's right to citizenry is protected. So the second issue has to do with guarding this idea that we have a shared heritage. The third issue and last issue I will raise has to do with power 
and systems. That power and systems must be used to serve all with equity. Power and systems must be used to serve all with equity. Where there is inequality, structural and systemic oppression, there cannot be unity. Sometimes we observe that some people, no matter how hard they work, they can never better their lives because of the way things have been designed. So you find that a place just 100 kilometers out of Kampala has no reliable telephone network, has no electricity, just 100 kilometers. Then you travel a certain direction, 350 uh, kilometers, and you have, they have a stable telephone network, they have electricity, and they have running water in their homes. And so these systems, these structures of inequality are what keep us from being united as a country. We have farmers who put in so much hard work, rising early in the morning. But the systems of business in the urban especially is such that the farmer cannot take their own produce to the market, but they must go through middlemen. So when you arrive with your lorry or Diana truck of cassava, you'll not be allowed to sell it in Kalere or Nakawa or Nakasero. It must be sold through a middleman. Those are structures of injustice. Corruption and killing of innocent lives with impunity. Some people seemingly having the protection of the state to break the law. Forcing people under the gun to make certain legal statements. And some government contracts can never be won if you are not connected to a particular people. I'm looking at how we use power, how we design systems, how they include some and lock out others. And when you have that kind of dynamic, Uganda cannot be united. A community cannot be together because the design of systems has already disunited the people. When this issue of abuse of power and systemic sin is not addressed by the leader and potential leader, we cannot have unity. It creates a gap between the haves and the have-nots. It creates a gap between the included and the excluded. And any leader, any unifying leader must address those gaps. In the second part, let me show you Jesus as the leader par excellence. Jesus as the leader we all must emulate. And there are four things I will mention about Jesus and his leadership style. Number one, Jesus was a leader who was not full of himself. He was not full of himself. His power and glory did not get to his head. He was important, yet approachable by all. Even children would come near Jesus and have a wonderful time with this eternal king, with this celestial king, with this universal king. Listen to what the scripture says about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus had, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So in Jesus we see one who does not idolize power? One who does not idolize glory. He lays, he lays it all down and becomes like a servant. He teaches us something important. That when you are a leader, do not allow the power to get to your head. When you are a leader, do not allow your position to become your idol. Hallelujah. What a wonderful savior. 
The second thing we see <clears throat> about Jesus is this, that there was no task that was below his level. There was no job he could say, that is too cheap for me to be involved in. That is way below my pay grade. That was not Jesus. In John chapter 13, he washed his disciples' feet. That task was supposed to be performed by slaves, Gentile slaves in a home. When it's time to serve dinner and no disciple is willing to do that job, Jesus ties a towel around his waist and goes and washes the feet of his disciples one by one. And he's teaching you and me that for a leader, if something needs to be done, it should be the leader to do it first. Not to wait for people of that level to attend to it, but a leader must model servanthood by being the first to take up the assignment. Jesus was the kind of leader who would do it. He was a leader coach, leading by example and leading through modeling. Number three, his view of leadership was that, that a leader is a servant. And he makes that point strongly in Matthew chapter 20. When his disciples were competing for recognition, Jesus says to them, no, 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 no. The first of you, the greatest of you must be the servant of all. And in that, Jesus redefines leadership. Jesus delinks power, prestige, and privilege from leadership. A leader must be people-centered, looking out for the people she or he leads and meeting their needs. What a powerful reimagining of leadership that in Jesus' worldview, power, prestige, and privilege are delinked from leadership. Number four, and lastly, Jesus is a leader who laid down his life for the sake of his subjects. He laid down his life for the sake of his subjects, demonstrating that a leader must be willing to make sacrifices. A leader must be willing to make sacrifices. Jesus laid down the, his life as the ultimate sacrifice. And so, Jesus is the uniting leader par excellence. He draws all people to himself, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, learned and illiterate, religious and irreligious. He draws all of them to himself as a uniting leader. And those of us who have worked with Jesus, we have experienced the Jesus leadership model. And we have seen its fruits. For example, by his spirit, he binds people together in authentic fellowship, regardless of political affiliation, background, or socioeconomic status. He's able to build one community of believers, regardless of color of skin, level of education, what they have or they do not have, by his spirit, he binds people together. Jesus is the one who frees our hearts from selfishness and prejudice, that we have clean hearts to lead other people, clean hearts to lead people into God's will. Jesus is the one who heals the world by healing individual hearts. When Jesus is at the center of one's life, when Jesus is at the center of one's marriage, when Jesus is at the center of a family, when Jesus is at the center of a community, when Jesus is at the center of a nation, that nation will be united. And that's why we sing and pray at the same time in our national anthem. O Uganda, may God uphold thee. O Uganda, may God uphold thee. And even for our motto, we say for God and my country. As you campaign this season, as you stand for elective 
politics this season. As we choose leaders all across this country, as we will choose, soon choose leaders, even on our parish or church councils, may God guide us to choose unifying leaders. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, we thank you for your word. Ancient words, ever true. It's these words that change me, change my neighbor, and change us together. Lord, we pray that you'll keep us united as a country. Lord, we pray especially for our leaders that they will not lose track. The sin of selfishness, self-centeredness, self-aggrandizement, and anything that is selfish, we pray that those sins will be broken and destroyed. We pray that you will prevent self-serving leaders from leading this nation. So take charge of the, of the campaigns, Lord. Take charge of the forthcoming elections, Lord. And grant us leaders who will lead us into your purposes for this season. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.